Welcome everyone to our discussion on the untapped power of wikis for open education and information literacy. This forms part of our monthly webinars uh, on a gauntlet of different topics. If you haven't met us before, we're a friendly bunch of folk from the uh, Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group of Ascalo. And our community is a diverse rainbow of uh, educational technologists, librarians, academics, school teachers, and more. Apart from our webinars, we meet once a month to connect with each other and share our current practices and how we're tackling different problems. We also put out a monthly OEP, Open Educational Practices Digest, which is a 360 degrees wrap of all things open education in Australasia including the newest open textbooks, uh, fresh off the press. I'm going to make a bit of a shameless pitch here. You can get this emailed straight to your inbox and hear about our events uh, by signing up on the website, uh, which I will paste into the chat. Here's a cheeky snapshot of our previous webinars for the year and we encourage you to get on our YouTube channel and uh, check out all the topics we've covered over the last few months. Before we go any further, I want to recognise our webinar is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and other um, traditional owners of the land across Australia and we acknowledge them as traditional owners. I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and uh, Aboriginal elders of any other communities who may be here today. And this is a lovely artwork of Bunjil, a created deity in Indigenous mythology, who often takes the form of a wedge-tailed eagle. And this was painted by Wurundjeri woman Judy Nicholson. So I'm pretty stoked to introduce our speakers today, a dynamic duo from both from University of Canberra. First up, we've got James Neal. He's really passionate about open, ed, uh, open academia, which in his view means sharing knowledge openly. He works as an assistant professor in the discipline of psychology at University of Canberra. And he teaches an undergrad psych unit called Motivation and Emotion. Previously he's taught personality, individual differences, social psychology, and research methods in psych. He's a custodian of English Wikiversity, and he's got research expertise in outdoor education, green exercise, and more broadly in positive psychology and environmental psychology. Uh, and he's also been an insightful member of this community um, for the last few months. So we're over the moon to have him speaking today on using Wikiversity for enabling psychology students as co-creators of OER. We've also got Mat Mathieu O'Neill, the Professor of Communication, also University of Canberra, uh, the News and Media Research Centre there in the Faculty of Arts and Design. And he founded the Journal of Peer Production in 2011 and the Digital Commons Policy Council Think Tank in 2021. And his current research projects include analysing the political economy of researcher contributions on GitHub repositories, mapping the health or openness of online discursive environments, and developing new information literacy methods for school teaching. So with, oops, no. <laughs> so with that, um, take it away, James, who's first up. Thanks, Stephen, and hello to you folks from Ngunnawal country near Canberra, uh, where I can assure you that literally as we speak, we're finding um, evidence of human occupation up to 20,000 years ago, um, which is kind of exciting that it's, uh, yeah, the past is uh, joining with the future as, as we speak. Uh, so. I'm going to share with you today about what I see as the potential for using wikis in open education. 
and what I've got a few questions here to put to you um, that you might chat away. Um, as you probably noticed when I've um, been in other presentations, I find it uh, just as much fun to talk about what's happening rather than just listen. So um, I'm curious about what's your wiki expertise. I've already seen a few people in the chat comment that they're Wikipedians. You've got people on here with um, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of edits and others who have perhaps only ever read but not edited um, a wiki. And if you do have some sort of wiki experiences, I'm curious to know about what platforms maybe you've used or edited um, or how you might have used wikis in your curricula. And finally, as we go, if you've got any questions or comments or ideas, feel free to, to pop them in. Now, mostly um, what I'm going to do today is share links with you. So this is the outline of what I'll talk about. But the further we go, the more links I'll pop into the chat. And I encourage you to click and explore and see, see where you go. I'm an old hack. Uh, I've tinkered with various tools, techniques, and platforms to try and serve open education over the last few decades. In so doing, it's become apparent to me that wikis offer some remarkably underutilized open education affordances. Wikis are free, uh, they're open, and they're easy to edit with full version control. Wikis offer a powerful conduit for staff and students to access and contribute to the knowledge commons. In some ways, it's the most native way of interacting with the knowledge commons. So I see wikis as offering an ideal platform for developing collaborative online authoring skills across all disciplines. Uh, there's a place, I think, for every discipline to make a contribution towards op open knowledge. So I hope to illustrate to you today some of the educational potentials of using wikis, and I'll use an ongoing case study uh, in which undergraduate students have developed over 1,300 online open educational resource book chapters about um, motivation and emotion topics since 2010. And so this might be seen as an example of, a, of an authentic assessment exercise. As Stephen said, I identify as an open academic, and by that I mean that I value openness, freedom, and transparency in education, research, and university service. And there's two particular principles, I guess, that guide me in open educational design. The first one being uh, the idea of open by default, and that educational material should be as open as possible, and really only as closed as necessary. And I think we all know that that default is becoming more of a default over time, but we've still got a long way to go, I think, in uh, that being the culture in um, public education. The second principle for me is that everything should be maximally reusable. So educational materials should be open to edit, and the formats should allow for maximum reuse. So a simple example would be sharing an SVG image, a scalable vector graphic image, rather than a PNG, because an SVG is, is entirely editable pixel by pixel, uh, whereas a PNG is a fixed file. So following these principles seems to have led me naturally to Wiki, much as following a watercourse might naturally lead to a waterhole. So there's several features of wikis that I think 
um, offer great affordance for open education. First of all, the content is openly editable. Uh, and this is probably the most notable feature that the software provides a robust system for managing open content in a, in a stable way. So it is editable, but there are ways to manage, you know, bad edits or, or poor edits. And for me, this contrasts with a lot of open educational resources, which are not publicly edit editable, like a lot of the um, open textbooks that are being produced. They're openly licensed, but uh, for example, to take a very trivial example, if I find a typographical error in an open textbook, uh, it's not easily fixable. Secondly, wikis are quick. In fact, the word wiki comes from the Hawaiian word wiki wiki, uh, which was the name of a bus system that allowed people to move quickly between places. And so that word was adopted by the people who made the first wikis because what they were looking for was the simplest uh, and quickest web page that can be edited by anyone. So in many ways, I, I see this as um, perhaps what should be the default internet technology rather than the passive internet. Um, in which we largely only consume rather than edit content. Uh, the editing process is easy to learn and it's empowering when people learn how to edit a wiki. Students can be taught basic wiki editing techniques for even a complex assignment within about an hour. And most students find that incredibly empowering to realize that they can shift from being a content consumer to becoming a knowledge commons contributor. Now, most people are most familiar with Wikipedia. It's the best known wiki. It's the largest encyclopedia in human history. And it's been created by crowdsourcing using the infrastructure provided by the nonprofit Wikimedia Foundation. What most people don't appreciate is that the Wikimedia Foundation also supports several sister wiki projects on the same platform using the same technology. And they include projects such as Wikibooks, um, Wikiversity, so Wikibooks for authoring new books, Wikiversity for teaching and learning materials and activities uh, and research, Wiki Species for information about flora and fauna, Wiki Commons for images, audio, multimedia, files, documents, etc. And there are many more. Um, each sister project has unexplored potential, I think, for open education and for higher education. All the Wikimedia Foundation sister project content is available under a Creative Commons share alike license, uh, allowing maximum reusability and ensuring that that open knowledge continues to be built upon uh, as open uh, material. In terms of applications in education, uh, there is a separate nonprofit organization called Wiki Education. And I'll put the link in the chat for you, which has as its mission to engage students and academics to improve Wikipedia, uh, enrich student learning and build a more informed public. So, Wiki Education supports teachers who wish to engage their students in editing Wikipedia, and it's a good option for an academic who is keen but really doesn't know where to start, um, but they may have a vision of their students being able to improve content on Wikipedia. And so they provide a kind of conduit and um, support to, to get ac academics engaged in edit, uh, with their students in editing Wikipedia. However, 
Wikipedia can be a crowded and difficult place, especially for novice teachers and students. And it is only for encyclopedic information. So it has limited scope uh, for many educational applications. Uh, and I think it's important to provide an environment which helps teachers and students build their online editing confidence and gain momentum and, and traction with their e efforts. And sometimes Wikipedia is not the place to do that because there's a lot of um, um, people breathing down other people's necks, shall we say, for you know not getting things quite right. So I encourage you to look outside Wikipedia and see whether one or more of the sister projects mightn't offer a, a better opportunity. And in many cases, the answer might be diversity because the reason the etra of Wikiversity is for teaching, learning and research, the very things that we're engaged in in universities. Anyone can edit or create content on Wikiversity, um, teachers, students, the public. And to get familiar with Wikiversity, one of the fun things you can do, you can do this on Wikipedia too, is to try out the random link. So if you click on that link and refresh it several times, you'll start to get a feel for the kinds of things that you might find on Wikiversity might be curriculum, lesson plans, assignments, lectures, class activities, um, things like that. As you're refreshing that random link, you might eventually come to something like um, these conclusions. Uh, firstly, that there's a lot of material. Uh, there's about 30,000 open educational resources there on Wikiversity. However, that pales in comparison to Wikipedia. It's about one two hundredth the number of articles, and it's certainly even less than that in terms of content. The second thing that might become obvious is that most of the resources lack sufficient development. Um, they're often probably what we would call stub status, and it might be a title and a little bit of information or, or an idea. So there's a great need to build out the depth, um, breadth and overall quality of the resources. So how might we make use of Wikiversity in higher education? I teach a third year psychology um, unit called Motivation and Emotion with about 150 students per year. The entire unit is available on Wikiversity, and that's the link if you want to check it out. Uh, and the aim of this unit is to help students understand what makes people think and feel the way they do, and how our motivational and emotional lives can be improved through an understanding of psychological theory and research. Now, in this unit, students are tasked with a major learning and assessment project, which is to produce an open educational written resource in the form of a 4,000 word online book chapter, as well as a three minute multimedia video. And they each focus on a unique topic. Uh, it's a topic that no student has covered before. So when we've, so we've written 1,300 chapters, that's 1,300 unique topics. So let's have a look at how this um, project is scaffolded. Um, the first step is that students choose one of a, a unique topic. They can sign up to a topic that uh, I list ahead of time, or they can negotiate a unique topic if they've got a particular passion or interest. Uh, they're welcome to propose that. And in most cases, we can work out a suitable question for them. 
second step is that students get some training in the initial uh, two weeks of semester. And I cover something about Wiki and why we're using Wiki and how to use Wiki in the first couple of lectures and the first couple of tutorials. But really the nuts and bolts of how to edit, how to set up an account, sign up to a topic and do basic editing, add headings, add dot points, et cetera, is covered in about 30 to 45 minutes in a tutorial. And many students don't even need that. They just work it out themselves. Um, I will add as a footnote that I find it far easier to teach students how to use a wiki than staff. Um, the next step is what we call the topic development. And this is where students build out a plan for their chapter. Um, they can import a template that gives them some generic headings and suggestions, and then they start editing that to um, create a heading structure with dot points, some key references, uh, an image that matches their topic. So they have to go and find an image on, on Wiki Commons or upload one. And so this is a low stakes assessment due before the, the census period to check that they're engaged um, and have found their way around uh, the Wiki environment. So this is a link to an example of um, a page at a certain point in development at that topic development stage. And that would then get marked and they would receive feedback. They then progress to authoring uh, the full book chapter. And um, along the way, I'll talk more to this towards the end, other students may be commenting or even editing their chapter and as the instructor I may also be jumping in there and um, having a look at what's going on and, and giving them an, a nudge along. The structure of the chapter includes focus questions, uh, integration of theory and research that demonstrates critical thinking and a conclusion with with take-home messages. Our audience uh, the general public that I use the example of imagine being at an airport waiting for your plane and you've got 10 minutes to wander around and you go into the bookshop and you wander over to the pop psychology section and you start flipping through all these sort of interesting books and that warm fuzzy feeling that you get um, and you feel like taking one of those books onto the plane that's the kind of audience we're looking for but it must have citations and be based in, in psychological theory and research. Having completed their book chapter and now being experts on their topic, students go ahead and create a three minute multimedia overview, which describes the problem, the, the knowledge and the take home messages. Um, Oh, I might be a link or two behind here. So that's an example of a finished chapter. And these would be the guidelines for the multimedia presentation with an example of presentation. So the presentations can be hosted on any platform as long as they can just submit a publicly accessible link to the presentation and the chapter links to the presentation and the presentation links back to the chapter. Uh, so since 2010, students have produced about 1300 unique chapters. Um, and there is a sort of a front uh, entry to those chapters here. And that allows you to navigate by year. There's tables of contents. Um, you can search. And chapters are also listed in multiple categories, which is one of the nice sort of hierarchical structured features of Wiki is that you can 
group and organize content quite dynamically and, and flexibly. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I've emphasized uh, this is an individual exercise, but collaboration is strongly encouraged and incentivized. Uh, about 10% of the marking criteria for the topic development in the book chapter is dedicated to their social contributions. And that is basically editing outside of their own book chapter, giving other people feedback, uh, contributing to discussion forums or posting, you know, new images to wiki commons or using the units hashtag basically anything they do in the public online space uh, can count uh, so well, i think that's the hashtag from from last year so some of you might be sitting there thinking what students often think when they first hear about this and that is that um how can this work? And I often liken it to riding a bike, that when you look at a bike, you think that's impossible, it's going to fall over. It's only got two wheels. So when students hear that they're going to be working in the public where other people can see what they're doing and change what they're doing, um, there's an initial scepticism. But once they jump in and make some edits and actually get the benefit of me editing and contributing and others contributing, uh, that usually turns around. And I've only ever had one student who had a visual disability who said that they preferred not to do this and they ended up, we negotiated that they would just um, do a Word document. Unhe unhelpful edits are remarkably rare, almost always unintentional and easily reversible through version control. Um, so, there are simpler projects that you could do. This is a more advanced or complex um, project. And this is an example of a fairly simple exercise that was done on Wikibooks by a, a colleague and students just did, you know, fairly short article critiques um, as part of their assessment. So, in conclusion, I think that wikis are very well aligned with open educational values, such as accessibility, transpar uh, transparency, and editability. Students can be taught and can learn how to uh, express themselves online, share ideas, solve problems, manage projects in a dynamic environment, much like what they'll be doing in the workplace. And indeed, these things they produce serve as um, e-portfolios and evidence to potential employers about what they can do. It's the instructor's job to model that openness in problem solving and um, develop enough skills to provide support, but there is a broad community of support out there. Um, I was mentored online, you know, by other um, wiki people and am very happy to uh, return that favour to others. So I, I encourage you to take a look at how wikis might be able to turbocharge your curriculum. Thank you. Thanks, James, that was wonderful. Uh, we'll pass straight on to uh, Machu now. James, we might need you to unshare first. Hi everyone, it's great to be able to, uh, to have this opportunity to speak to you. I am very glad we did it in this order because we're debating which order to do it. I think it's much better this way because you've got a lot of detail about how Wikipedia works and what it is. And now my purpose here is to show how I've been working with people to kind of publicize uh, and promote Wikipedia use in schools, but also in other other places so it's much more general 
and I've got a lot of slides. So it's sort of very, the very complimentary presentations. I'm just going to fly through and I've asked um, Stephen if you could post a few links along the way because I'm just going to go really quick. Um, I also want to say that I noted there's a couple of people from Wikimedia Australia here, Prue and James, and um, they asked me to present tomorrow night on updating them on what we're doing for the weekly or monthly meetings. So I probably will be presenting something quite similar. So I guess Prue and I will have to have a bit of a, a think about how to, how to address that, but um, that's life. Okay, so I'm talking from another world country uh, like James in Canberra. Um, I just want to briefly explain what I'm going to talk about. So uh, just give some, some brief definitions. Uh, media literacy asks questions such as what are lifestyle, what lifestyles, values, and points of view are represented in or omitted from a message. So it's very much about power, about who's in the frame. Um, so it's about how media represents the world. I'm not going to talk about media literacy today. What I'm talking about is information literacy, which I suppose everybody here is very familiar with, is just about correctness of information. Is it is a statement true or false? So I'll be clear why I don't want to address media literacy for the moment. Um, just starting with there's two considerations that orient our work. The first is that um, we live in what's known as an inf attention economy. Um, we're constantly solicited by, uh, you know, prompts, claims, and so we have to be aware that that's the information environment that we're in. You know, there's. Uh, in, was Herbert Simon, who's an economist, made his famous statement in the early 70s when he was just broadcast media, now with social media, everybody can create, curate information. So there's so many claims, we don't know um, which are correct or not. So how do we deal with uh, a philosopher called Kim Sterelny called in the early 2000s, epistemic pollution? How do we verify? How do we trust? Just a couple of examples from a disinformation campaign that was run between 2015 and 2020 um, by the uh, Russian uh, IRA. Uh, so fake documents, one fake video from Greenpeace and one fake letter from the committee uh, to uh, protect journalism. I think that's the acronym, uh, which was spread. And you know they, they look completely authentic. So how can we know even if authentic looking information is correct? You know, there's a lot of pollution happening. The other issue, apart from the fact that there's an overabundance of information, and so we have to be parsimonious with our attention, is that there's a crisis of trust happening. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of this came out of the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and Brexit, and there's a lot of hype around these terms. So these people from the RAND Corporation, which is a kind of, um, you know, American think tank, very establishment, they compared the present period with earlier periods. And they found that, you know, some of these traits have existed in the past, you know, blurring of the line between opinion and fact. But what's new today is that there's incredibly strong decline of trust um, in uh, what people used to, you know, think was uh, factual sources of information. And this decline of trust in institutions is, is something that is very apparent in Australia. Uh, the ANU runs, has run an Australian election study, um, and they found, you know, 70% of people believe government, people in government look after themselves. Um, only 12% believe government is for all the people. So it's pretty, pretty stark. Uh, and in terms of the news media, um, the, the News and Media Research Centre at UC runs the digital news report, uh, the Australian part of the digital news report, and you can see how decline uh, in the, the what the news uh, tells you, uh, in the trust of, of what the news tells you has been constant um, from between 2016 and, and 2022. Um, uh, you can see the figure for the United States is the lowest uh, in the survey. This, I think they survey something like 40 countries every year about people's attitude about news. So there's a decline in trust. So what, are, what, is, what do we use in Australia? Um, some educators, you're probably familiar with this acronym, uh, CRAP. So when you confront a claim or a website, you know, you, you ask yourself some questions like, you know, is it current? Is it relevant? 
Um, is it authoritative? Is it accurate? What is its purpose? So you look at the about page, for example. <clears throat> you'd look at you know whether whether it's been updated. You know you'd look at the design, uh, whether there's footnotes, whether there's you know is it a .org or a .com? Because .org is better than .com because .com means they're commercial, right? Or are there ads? Because if there's ads, maybe it means they're also commercial. So that's no good. Those sorts of you know checklists. The problem with that approach is that it results in cognitive overload there's too many things to think about um and so you people tend to latch on to the most obvious thing like you know it's a dot org must be good uh also visual and design cues are not that effective um anybody can make a really good looking page and basically this wastes time it takes a lot of time to figure things out often when there's an intent to misinform or sorry to disinform you, the people who do it, they mix the true and the fake, you know, so it could take you hours to figure out what's real and what's not real. So that's not good. Um, when there's overabundance of information, people should avoid wasting their attention. So fact checking should be fast. And when trust in institutions and compromise, people uh, need a reason to trust information. So fact checking needs to be inclusive, right? Okay, so very briefly, um, I wanted to bring your attention, if, if you haven't heard about this uh, article by a, sort of like a super group, you know, like you had super groups in the 70s, or the, you know, we did all these different musicians, and this is like a super group of academics with, uh, um, well, Sam Weinberg is from Stanford, and he's come up with the lateral reading uh, framework, and Stephen Lewandowski is uh, famous for the debunking handbook, and the other two people have also got their own theoretical contributions. So they, they come up with this idea that today it's not about critical thinking, it's about critical ignoring. You, know, you need to know what not to look at, when not to engage, when not to, think, when not to go deep. And so I'm focusing on the second one of the critical ignoring ideas, which is natural reading. Um, the third one, don't feed the trolls, is pretty self-evident. You know, if somebody's being disruptive, they want your attention, just don't engage. You know, report them, whatever, but don't waste your time. Self nudging is a bit more complicated. I'll very briefly talk about it. The one that's most relevant to fact checking is lateral reading. So, what is lateral reading? It's a way what, what fact checkers do. Um, I don't have time to show you this video, but uh, hopefully we can have the, the link in the uh, in the chat. So, it's a it's a video based on a, an experiment they ran at Stanford. Uh, where they ask different groups of people, they get they say, okay, you have five minutes to check claims made by these two organizations. One of them is the American College of Pediatricians, and the other one is the um, American Academy of Pediatri Pediatrics, or something like that. So, you know, claims about bullying or about weight or something like that. And so, you know, if you look at the websites, they both look kind of similar. Uh, the only problem is that the first one, the, the, the one at the top, is a respected organization of 70,000 health professionals, which has you know, been around and very legitimate. The second one is just has a five or 600 people as the members, and they're basically a hate group, uh, very opposed to uh, you know, gay rights, etc. So if, if you just look at what they say, you might not figure that out. And, Unfortunately, of those three groups, both the, the PhD students and the professional historians got it wrong. They either thought that the uh, American College of Pediatricians was as legitimate or more legitimate than the other one. On the other hand, the pro professional fact checkers, in one less than a minute, they figured out what was going on and they knew what was what and which one was credible. How did they do it? Well, they used lateral reading which is that you don't engage vertically. You don't go deep with a claim. You look away. You look at what the information environment tells you. You open another tab on your browser and you search. If the source is reliable, if the claim is valid, great, you keep reading. If it isn't, you move on. So it's really the opposite of what we taught is that you know we need critical thinking. We need to figure out logic, You know the, the argument that's being made. And, and, Try and figure out if it's worth, uh, you know, if, if it stacks up. This is the opposite. You don't, you don't do that. You just look away. Um, so this is how they summarize those three uh, ideas. So the nudges is the first uh, one. It's about, you know, 
changing the way you interact with your information environment. You have to have better self-control. So for example, you know, people who have problems with attention, you tell them, um, you know, spend 20 minutes working and then reward yourself by looking at something fun for 10 minutes. And they, this is saying, well, actually, if you do that, you're going to go, you know, you're going to then spend half an hour or 40 minutes looking at something fun. So it's about controlling how you interact with your information environment. Second one is natural reading. I've just explained that. Third one is trolls and malicious actors, which is the don't engage, basically. So self-nudging. Um, so the second paragraph says, a link, you, you have to be aware of the link between your environment, your behavior, and the architecture of the environment. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I don't have enough time, so we can talk about it later if you want, but it's it's interesting stuff anyway. Okay, so check where. Well, I just want to uh, bring to your attention a submission to a, a Senate committee that I made with some colleagues. Uh, there was two parts. The first one is about information literacy. And the second one is about uh, information health, which was based on network analysis of information environments, where we try and map how open, diverse, uh, discursive environments on Twitter or Reddit are. I'm not going to talk about that today, but what I want to talk about is the three principles which orient uh, these ideas. So speed, I've already talked about, nonpartisanship, you want to be as inclusive as possible, particularly when you're dealing with school kids. So that's why we don't focus on media literacy so much. Um, and the third one is transparency, because the opposite of conspiracy, of distrust, is transparency. Um, and this think tank in the UK, Demos, they actually said in 2010, they were quite precise, conspiracy theories are a reaction to the lack of transparency and openness in many of our institutions. The more open our institutions, the less likely we are to believe we are living in a conspiring world. Okay, so this is just some examples of how transparency is important. Uh, open source software, open source intelligence, open data. Open data is when government releases its data, but you know it, it's actually not great if the people who are looking at it on train can't tell if the data is okay or not. And finally, Wikipedia. Wikipedia, a wiki, as James said, uh, is a website where every change is archived. Every time you change an article, even a comma, there's a that's a, an archive then, so you can it's completely auditable. So it's quite shocking because it's a change in what we trust in where we place our belief. So the first encyclopedia encyclopedia was French. Just check the time. I'm going for time. How much more can I go? What? Uh, a few more minutes. Okay. I'm going to have to fly through. So yeah, so you play, you trust the author, you trust it all, then you trust the brand, and then you trust the probabilities. Um, comparative studies show medical information is just as accurate. Uh, Wikipedia's got all these policies, uh, neutral point of view, reliable sources, no original research, thousands of volunteers ensure that these policies are adhered to. Um, if a page doesn't have many editors, it might be less reliable. But you can also always check the history and talk pages. So here's an example of the revision, what it looks like. You have an article, you, print, you go on history, every time there's a change, there's a line, and then if you click on that line, you'll see the difference between the two versions. In this case, it was just one word. So there are some problems. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time. So sometimes there is manipulation of content. Sometimes there are systemic imbalances. So I'm just going to skip that one. Um, there are a lot more biographies of women, of men than women on Wikipedia. So um, 19 point, you know, there's basically 20% of biographies of women. But even when there's women represented, they are represented differently. A 2015 study found that the word divorced appears four times as often in women's biographies on English Wikipedia and does in comparables men biographies. So completely specious, but you know, it, this sort of emphasizes how the, the patriarchal nature of society. Wikipedia reflects the world, right? So what we did was we took these ideas and we used them to make some lessons for kids uh, in the um, four uh, ACT schools. And so we sort of structured this from the least complex, you know, foundational knowledge. What's in, you know, what is a fact? What is Wikipedia? Then lateral reading. Uh, when you find a, a sandwich on the street, would you read it? 
and then ad hominems, you know, emotional responses, and then red cars. If you see an information and something, it will all over. Like, you know, if you if you get new shoes, you'll notice those shoes. If your parents get a red car, you'll see red cars, same, same thing. If you see something all over, doesn't mean it's true. And the last one is about finding evidence. We did that. We've compiled these lessons as a book, a booklet, um, and it's available for free download, if you like, from the APO. Um, so yeah, difference between being critically literate, digitally, li digitally literate, you know, it's a big change for a lot of education policy. Um, yeah, and then I had some stuff about reactions from different groups of people, but I won't, I'm not gonna have time. So when we presented this, these ideas to uh, commenters on the conversation, you know, some people were extremely negative, but they were in the minority. Uh, so there's still a lot of negative views about Wikipedia. Um, then we also had some really good responses when we did a workshop from teacher librarians who said they wanted to promote this and be advocates. Um, teacher librarians are our, our greatest supporters. Um, we've been reviewed in the access. Um, and uh, yep. And then we had also the basically our, our co researchers that we worked with. They said, you know, the problem is teacher education in universities. So we're working on that. Uh, kids, they, um, they changed the fact checking, but they still distrust Wikipedia. So that's very ingrained. And finally, um, we are trying to finish a report about strategies for the recognition and use of Wikipedia in Australian educational settings. There's been some discussion about doing some micro credentials, but it's a bit of a complicated terrain. And so the, what we're doing now is we are uh, put an application in to focus on teacher librarians in uh, ACT New South Wales and Victoria. So we'll be reaching out to people. I uh, also want to do this in Indonesia, and also we're going to redo it in Canberra with the ACT Education Directorate, uh, but with high schools. And it's part of the Digital Commons Policy Council uh, effort to kind of recognize digital commons and the volunteer labor that produces them. So thanks very much. Uh, and those are the things we're working on now with the Digital Commons. Thanks. Thanks, Machu. Really appreciate it. And uh, there's a few comments in the chat about uh, liking the term critical ignoring, among other things you mentioned. Um, let's jump straight into the discussion since we don't have that much time. Um, I think, you know, an interesting intersection has been the uh, use of wikis in your teaching, James, and the rise of chat GPT at the same time and the debates around ap academic integrity. Do you want to answer Jackie's, uh, Jackie W's question about whether you think the use of wikis in your teaching has reduced any cases or frequency around academic integrity? Yeah, uh, I think version control assignments help and, and wiki provides that it's not the only way to do a version controlled assignment but i find it hard to believe in the 21st century that most assignments are just this single document when there is a version history and it, there, there are ways of recording that editing history um so from that point of view it helps it doesn't prevent it uh i'm going to be giving this a go allowing students to use ai in semester two and but because they provide an edit summary with every edit they do they're going to i'm going to give them a format they'll have to say what their prompt was what their platform was etc um so yeah that's a way i'm going to experiment i guess with navigating the ai issue using that version controlled approach great thanks james and there's some comments uh mature about enthusiasm of uh, teacher librarians to participate in this future project if you get funding? Yes, yeah, so I already responded in the chat. Um, I didn't mention Queensland because we hadn't had any people contacting us from Queensland, but sure, no, that's fine. There's no, it, there's no um, boundary around who can do it. So the more the merrier. Um, I'm not sure when we'll find out, hopefully in the next month or so. And then we'll be using different kind of venues to try and recruit people to come in and co-develop. One of the things I should have mentioned is that the um, the really good thing about this, this program in the ACT with the 
faculty of education that I'm working with. I'm, I'm in a faculty of arts and design, but I've been working with faculty of education colleagues and they have an affiliated schools program. So we actually co-develop with the teachers by having sort of feedback sessions and adjusting the stuff. So that's been really great. And so it'd be great to be able to do that with teacher librarians as well. For the next version is Sounds like a really good way for universities and schools to work together. So that's really great. Um, question for, for James from Ash Barber of Uni of SA. Um, it's basically uh, when you get pushback from staff about Wikiversity, um, how do you how do you respond? What do you find best way to respond to this? Well, to be honest, you know, my single greatest failing is um, having failed to convince anybody to do anything like what I do. Um, but more generally, it's not about using wiki. It's it's about um, trying to encourage use of greater openness in education, whatever platform or you're using. Um, and to be honest, since I've uh, uh, finding this group has made it's given me sort of a bit of new energy because it does feel like you can feel a bit lonely sometimes uh, trying to prioritise and value open education in a system that doesn't. Um, but I see there's debate around with this universities accord because the Productivity Commission came out and suggested that all universities should make um, lectures and or curriculum open, like just open up our learning management systems and allow people in there because it would probably drive productivity um to have that information out there so yeah it, i'm hoping uh, things have been edging towards more openness and research has got it in the last sort of 10 years you've noticed open journals and so on coming through but i think education is at least a decade behind where things have been going with with open science and so on um but yeah i'm hopeful that it keeps going in the open direction And a question from Tim uh, about these, uh, the feedback from the students, the psychology students, how have they felt about writing these articles and um, what might you change according to that feedback? Well, they definitely go through a cycle of being confronted and challenged um, and then go through a training period. And once they get a sense of mastery and control and sort of reassurance that it's going to work, then ultimately usually quite proud of what they've done. And um, as I said, you know, I encourage them to add it to their e-portfolios and add it to their CVs. And at the end, we actually brainstorm things that they can add to their CV about skill sets they've got. So it's not just about the product, but also about the their confidence in collaborative authoring and, you know, communicating online and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, positive. Um, yeah, obviously there's always, you know, some grumpiness or things like that, but it's it's all manageable. Yeah, great. And... Uh... Machu, if uh, teacher librarians and others want to get in touch with you about being involved in the future, what's the best way to do that? Just email. Um, and perhaps last thing for James, uh, there was a question I think about, I'm trying to find it, <laughs> about uh, the use of interactive learning activities in Wikiversity pages and perhaps the challenge in getting students to write those questions, um, that it's not, not an easy thing. Did you want to expand on any of that? Oh, I, only just to add, when I explain this to students and get them to think about an essay that they would normally write and what makes a web page or a wiki page come alive, it's things like having links to terms so that you can go off and and, and learn about um, that concept, uh, images, tables, but they can also add interactive activities um, such as reflection questions or quizzes. Um, but the particular topic there, with, yeah, students, it's not that easy to write a good quiz question. And the goal here is not for assessment. The goal is just to sort of make a more interesting text. That So I actually encourage them to put maybe a single question a quiz question at the end of each section rather than an exam at the end. 
Um, so it's just sort of prompting people about what the key key points are as they go along. Oops, sorry. Uh, we have reached one o'clock. So thank you so much to James and Machu and everyone for coming along. I know there was a lot of discussion, so we will share the chat and the links and the slides. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the next webinar is on uh, why educators do or do not adopt OER in their learning and teaching and some fresh new evidence from a uh, PhD student who did his thesis on this. So come along next uh, next month and I'll put the link to that webinar for the registration for that in the chat so you can register and come along next month. So thank you everyone and see you next time. Thanks, bye.